Chapter One of Christmas Eve at Swamp's End. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Christmas Eve at Swamp's End by Norman Duncan. Chapter One The Wistful Heart it was long after noon in the far big white northwest day was on the wing christmas eve splendidly impended thank god for unspoiled childish faith and joys of children everywhere christmas eve was fairly within view and welcoming hail at last in the thickening eastern shadows long day at its close day in a perturbation of blessed unselfishness day with its tasks of love not half accomplished and day near done bedtime coming round the world on the jump nine o'clock leaping from longitude to longitude night impatient and determined chasing all the children of the world in drowsy expectation to sleep making a clean sweep of em every one with her soft wide broom of dusk nine o'clock shoo off you go to-morrow's on the way soon oh soon to-morrow's here when you fall asleep said em already have you not another word from either of you not a whisper ye grinning rascals cuddle down little people of christ's heart and leading snuggle close closer yet my children that your arms may grow used to this loving another kiss from mother blessed ones a billion more for nights and mornings for all day long of all the years waiting here on mother's lips and now to sleep christmas is to-morrow hush to-morrow yes to-morrow go to sleep go to sleep and upon the flying heels of night but still far overseas from the blustering white northwest where patty batch was waiting at swamp's end in the woods the new day with jolly countenance broad rosy and delighted was somewhere approaching in a gale of childish laughter blithely calling in its westward sweep to all christian children to awaken to their peculiar and eternal joy it was christmas weather in the big woods a christmas temperature like frozen steel thirty below in the clearing of swamp's end and a rollicking wind careering over the pines and the swirling dust of snow in the metallic air a cold crisp crackling world a christmas land too a vast expanse of christmas color from the canadian line to the big river great grave green pines white earth and a blood-red sunset the low log cabins of the lumber camps were smothered in snow they were fringed with pendant ice at the eaves and banked high with drifts and all window frosted the trails were thigh deep and drifting the pines their great fall imminent now flaunted long black arms in the gale they creaked they swished they droned they crackled with frost it was coming on dusk the deeper reaches of the forest were already dark horses and teamsters sawyers road monkeys axemen swampers punk hunters and all floundered from the bush white with dry snow icicled and frosted like a christmas cake to the roaring bunk-house fires to a voracious employment at the cook's long tables and to an expanding festival jollity town sure swamp's end for christmas 
the lights and companionship of the bedraggled shanty lumber town in the clearing of swamp's end swamp's end for gingerbread jenkins swamp's end for billy the beast swamp's end and the roaring hilarity thereof for man and boy straw boss and cookie of the lumberjacks presently the dim trails from the cant hook cutting from the bottled river camps from snook's landing and the yellow tail works poured the boys into town a lusty hilarious crew like loosed schoolboys on a lark giving over now to the only distractions it seemed and john fairmeadow maintained it which the great world provided in the forests patty batch might have been aware of this the log shack was on the edge of town had not the window panes been coated thick with christmas frost she might have heard rough laughter passing by the bottle river trail ran right past the door had not the big christmas wind snored in the stove and fearsomely rattled the door and shaken the cabin and swept howling on but she never in the world would have attended not in that emergency she would not for anything have peeped out of the windows in perfectly proper curiosity to watch the bottle river jacks flounder into town not she patty batch was busy patty batch was so desperately employed that her swift little fingers demanded all the attention that the most alert the brightest the very most bewitching gray eyes in the whole wide world could bestow upon anything whatsoever christmas eve you see day done something of soft fawn skin engaged her it seemed with white patches matched and arranged with marvellous exactitude something made for warmth in the wind something of small fashion but long and indubitably capacious something with a hood a little cloak possibly i don't know but i am sure that it could envelop that it could boil or roast, that it could fairly smother a baby. It was lined with golden-brown crackling silk, which Patty Batch's mother had left in her trunk, upon her last departure, poor woman, from the sordid world of Swamp's End, to regions which were now become, in Patty Batch's loving vision, places of light and it was upon this treasured cloth that patty batch's flashing needle was working like mad in the lamplight a christmas sacrifice it was labor of love and the gift of treasure patty batch was lovely everybody knew it and there's no denying it grief had not left her wan and apathetic she had been a little man she had been so much of a little man that she was now much more of a little woman than ever she had been before in respect to her bewitching endearments there's no mincing matters at all it would shame a man to him and haw and qualify she was adorable beauty of youth and heart of tenderness a quaint little womanly child of seventeen gowned now in a black dress long skirted to be sure of her mother's old-fashioned wearing gray eyes wide dark-lashed sun-sparkling and shadowy and wilful dark hair a sweetly tilted little nose a boyish masterful way coquettish twinkles dimples in most perilous places rosy cheeks a tender little figure an aristocratic toss to her head why indeed the catalogue of her charms has no end to it courage to boot too as though youth and loveliness were not sufficient endowment and uncompromising honesty with herself and all the world she took in washing from the camps 
there was nothing else to do with grey billy batch lost in rattle water and now decently stowed away by the reverend john fairmeadow it was lonely in grey billy batch's cabin now of course it was sometimes almost intolerably so and ghostly too with echoes of long past footsteps and memories of soft motherly words patty batch however a practical little person knew in her own mind you must be informed exactly how to still the haunting echoes and transform the memories into blessed companions of her busy gentle solitude but she had not as yet managed the solution patty batch wanted a baby companionship of course would be a mere by-product of a baby's presence in the cabin the real wealth and advantage would be a glowing satisfaction in the baby at any rate patty batch wanted one she always had and she simply couldn't help it babies however were not numerous at swamp's end in point of fact there was only one a perfectly adorable infant it must be understood a suitable child and worthy in every respect of being heartily desired by any woman which unhappily belonged to the bartender who lived with pale peter of the red elephant saloon no use asking for that baby not outright it could be borrowed however patty batch had borrowed it she had borrowed it frequently of late and had mysteriously measured it with a calculating eye and had estimated and scowled in doubt and scratched her head and pursed her sweet red lips and had secretly spanned the baby from chin to toe and across the back with an industriously inquiring thumb and little finger but a borrowed baby it seems is of no use whatsoever the satisfaction is said to be temporary nothing more and to leave a sense of vacant arms and a stinging aggravation of envy so what patty batch wanted was a baby to keep a baby she could call her own and cherish against meddling a baby that should be so rosy and fat and curly so neat and white so scrubbed and highly polished from crown to toe-nails that every mother in the land beholding would promptly expire on the spot of amazement incredulity and sheer jealousy there were babies at elegant corners a frowsy listless mud-hole of the woods near by they were all possessed by one mother too the last comer had appeared in the fall of the year and patty batch when the great news came down to swamp's end had instantly taken the trail for elegant corners got another eh huh? says she flatly to the wretched mrs limp uh-huh mrs limp sighed and rolled her eyes as though god save us the ultimate misfortune had fallen upon her number eight she groaned don't you like it patty demanded uh, hopefully mrs limp was so deeply submerged in tears that she failed to commit herself you don't like it eh huh? patty pursued hope immediately abounding mrs limp sniffed well said patty her little heart all in a flutter she was afflicted too with an adorable lisp in excitement i suppose i ought to be sorry mrs limp seemed dolefully to agree patty batch came then straight to the point i've been savin up said she i've been hard at it for more than seven month mrs limp lifted her blue eyelids yup said patty briskly and i got thirty four twenty three right here in my skirt where's that baby 
the baby was fetched and deposited in her arms boy or girl patty inquired with business-like precision boy mrs limp sighed thank god patty batch was vastly disappointed she had fancied a girl it was a shock indeed to her ardour it was so much of a shocking disappointment that patty batch might easily have wept a boy a boy oh shoot but still she reflected considering the scarcity a boy this boy in fact cleaned up patty batch was all the time running the mottled infant over with sharply appraising eyes yes the child had possibilities unquestionably so which soap and water might astonishingly improve and in fine this little boy might mrs limp said patty looking that lady straight in the eye i'll give you twenty-five dollars for this here baby by george i will the astonished mother jumped out of her chair and her lassitude at the same instant not another cent patty craftily declared here take your baby mrs limp did not quite take the baby that would be but a pale indication of the speed directness and outraged determination with which she acted she snatched the baby away with the precision of a brisk woodpecker after an escaping worm and she hugged it until it howled for mercy and she hushed it and she crooned endearment and she kissed the baby with such fervour and persistency that she saved its puckered face a washing and then she turned in a rage of indignation in a storm of scorn at a whirlwind of execration upon poor little patty batch but patty batch was gone discreet little patty batch didn't need to be told her little feet were already pattering over the trail to swamp's end and she was crying as she ran but patty batch's wish for a baby went back to the very beginnings of things ask gingerbread jenkins gingerbread jenkins knows it was gingerbread jenkins who had found her long ago patty was little more than a baby herself then on the bottle river trail and to gingerbread jenkins astonishment the child was lugging a gun into the woods where you goin says gingerbread jenkins gunnin gunnin eh? what for jeth gunnin but what you gunnin for none of your bithneth says saucy little patty batch it is my business gingerbread jenkins declared and if you don't tell me what you're gunnin for i'll have you home in a jiffy well says patty i'm a gunnin what for storks says patty goin to kill em gingerbread inquired no says patty what you gunnin for i'm goin to wing a couple says patty and tame em that was patty batch End of chapter 1 The Wistful Heart Chapter 2 of Christmas Eve at Swamp's End by Norman Duncan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 A Gift Neglected Well, well, there was only one baby at Swamp's End, and that baby patty batch had adopted in her mind of course quite on the sly nobody could adopt pale peter's bartender's baby in any other way and here was christmas come again day gone beyond the last waving pines in a cold flush of red and gold christmas eve here at last patty batch's soft arms were still wanting there were a thousand kisses waiting on her tender lips forgiving her voice was all attuned to crooning sweetest lullabies but her heart was empty save for a child of mist and wishes 
it was dark now but though the wind was still rollicking down there was no snow blowing and the shy stars were winking wide-eyed upon the busy world and all the myriad mysteries it exhibited out of doors the gift of silk and fawn skin was finished a perfect gift fashioned and accomplished with all the dexterity patty batch could employ just as if she had determined it was for my own baby and patty batch after an agitated glance at the clock quickly shooed and cloaked and hooded her sweet and blooming little self and she listened to the lusty wind and she put a most adorable little nose out of doors to sense the frosty weather and she fluttered about the warm room in search of her mittens and then she turned down the lamp chucked a log in the stove put on the dampers like a prudent householder and having made quite sure that the door was latched scampered off to town in vast and twittering delight with the nipping frost with the roistering wind the fluffy snow the stars the whole of god's clean world and with herself too and with the blessed night of the year she was exceedingly cautious and she was not observed not for the smallest flash the thing was accomplished in mystery before she was aware of it before her heart had eased its agitation she was safely out again and there in plain view on the table in pale peter's living-room behind the saloon lay the gift of silk and fawn skin for pale peter's bartender's baby a christmas mystery for them all to solve as best they could patty batch peeked in at the window i wonder she mused if they'll ever if they'll ever in the world find out i done it presently pale peter's bartender came in this was charlie the infidel patty batch rose on her cold little toes the better to observe the frost exploded like pistol shots under her feet she started really the little mite began to feel and rather exquisitely like a thief in the night there was another explosion of frost as she crept nearer her peak hole in the glowing window whew how deliciously mysterious it was nothing much however happened in pale peter's living-room to continue the thrill charlie the infidel in haste chanced to brush the fawnskin cloak off the table he paused impatiently to pick it up and to fling it back in a heap whereupon he pressed on to the bar that wasn't very thrilling you may be sure but charlie the infidel after all was only a father and patty batch her courage not at all diminished still waited in the frosty shadow quite absorbed in expectation entered then mrs bartender a blonde bored novel-reading little lady in splendid array first of all as patty batch observed she yawned secondly she yawned again and she was about to attempt the extraordinary feat of yawning a third time and doubtless would have achieved it when her washed blue eyes chanced to fall on the fawnskin coat with its lining of golden-brown silk shimmering in the lamplight she picked it up of course in a bored sort of way and she was positively on the very verge of being interested in it when would you believe it she attacked the third yawn or the third yawn attacked her and however it was the yawn was accomplished with such dexterity such certainty and with such satisfaction to the lady that she quite forgot to look at the fawnskin cloak again by george she's tired patty batch exclaimed to herself patty batch sighed 
She sighed twice, in point of fact. The second sigh, a great, long one, discovering itself somewhere very deep within. And then she went home, disconsolate. End of chapter 2 A Gift Neglected Chapter Three of Christmas Eve at Swamp's End by Norman Duncan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three The Making of a Man. Soon after dark, John Fairmeadow, with a pack on his broad back, swung from the jumping Jimmy trail into the clearing of Swamp's End ceasing only then his high vibrant song and came striding down the huddled street a big man in rare humour with life labour and the night a shadow not john fairmeadow's shadow was in cautious pursuit but of this dark secret follower john fairmeadow was not aware near the cafe of egyptian delights he stumbled the pursuing shadow gasped and john fairmeadow was so mightily exercised for his pack that he ejaculated in a fashion most unministerial but recovered his footing with a jerk and doubtless near turned pale with apprehension but the pack was safe the delicate contents whatever they were quite undisturbed john fairmeadow gently adjusted the pack stamped the snow from his soles as a precautionary measure wiped the frost from his brows and eyelids in the same cautious wisdom and still followed by the shadow strode on but with infinitely more care at the red elephant pale peter's glowing saloon he turned in the bar as always in these days gave the young apostle to those unrighteous parts a roaring welcome it was become a fashion big bubbling rosy john fairmeadow with the square jaw the frank admonitory tongue the tender and persuasive heart the competent not unwilling fists was welcome everywhere from the Bottle River camps and the Cant Hook cutting to the bunk houses of the Yellow Tail, from beyond the Divide to the lower waters of the Big River, in every saloon, bunk house, superintendent's office, and cook's quarters of this wide green parish. Welcome to preach and to pray, to bury, marry, gossip, and scold, and upon goodly provocation to fight all to the same righteous end a clean man a big broad-shouldered deep-chested long-legged body with a soul to match it a glowing heart and a purpose lifted high there was no mistaking the man by men john fairmeadow clad like a lumberjack upright now in the full stature of a man body and soul grinned like a delighted schoolboy his fine head was thrown back in the pride of clean sure strength his broad face was in a rosy glow his great chest still heaved with the labour of a stormy trail his grey eyes flashed and twinkled in the soft light of pale peter's many lamps twinkled and with merriment in that long stifling roaring smoky fume-laden room for a moment then closed a bit worn and melancholy too but presently with reviving faith to urge them opened wide and heartily and began to twinkle again the bar was in festive array christmas greens red berries ribbons tissue paper and gleaming tin foil flash of mirrors bright colour branches of pine cedar and spruce from the big balsamic woods it was crowded with lumberjacks great fellows from the forest big of body and passion here gathered in celebration of the festival john fairmeadow getting all at once and vigorously under way shouted merry christmas boys 
and hello charlie to the bartender and he shook hands with pale peter slapped billy the beast on the back roared a greeting to gingerbread jenkins exclaimed merry christmas with the speed and detonation of a gatling gun inquired after butcher long's brood of kids in the east and cried hello old man and what's the good word from yellowtail and how'd you do and glad to see ya and everywhere shook hands and clapped backs carefully preserving however his own back from being slapped and devoutly ejaculated god bless you men a merry christmas to you all and every one and eventually disappeared in the direction of pale peter's living quarters leaving an uproar of genial delight behind him john fairmeadow's shadow however unable to enter the bar of the red elephant waited in seclusion across the windy street mrs bartender was still yawning as john fairmeadow entered upon her ennui but when the big minister exercising the softest sort of caution slipped off his gigantic pack and deposited it with exquisitely delicate care and a face of deep concern on the table she opened her faded eyes with interested curiosity and as for the contents of the pack there's no more concealing them the article must now be declared and produced it was a baby of course it was a baby the thing has been obvious all along john fairmeadow's foundling left in a basket at the threshold of his temporary lodging-room at big rapids that very morning first to john fairmeadow's consternation and then to his gleeful delight as for the baby itself it was presently unswathed it is quite beyond me to describe its excellence of appearance and conduct john fairmeadow himself couldn't make the attempt and escape annihilation it was a real and regular baby however one might suggest in inadequate description that it was a plump baby one might add that it was a lusty baby it had hair it had a pucker of amazement its eyes two of them were properly disposed in its head its hands were of what are called rose-leaf dimensions it had apparently a fixed habit of squirming it had no teeth evidently a healthy baby a baby that any mother might be proud of doubtless a marvel of infantile perfection in every respect i should not venture to dispute such an assertion nor would john fairmeadow nor any other bold gentleman of swamp's end and elegant corners not in these later days mrs bartender of course lifted her languid white hands in uttermost astonishment there john fairmeadow exploded looking round like a showman what do you think of that eh huh? but mr fairmeadow the poor lady stammered what have you brought it here for why not john fairmeadow demanded why not indeed it's perfectly polite what am i to do with it oh it isn't intoxicated my good woman john fairmeadow ran on in great wrath and it's never been in jail but my dear mr fairmeadow do be sensible what am i to do with it why uh, i should think john fairmeadow ventured the baby was still sleeping like a brick that you might first of all uh, resuscitate it would a slight poke in the ribs provoke animation but the baby didn't need a poke in the ribs it didn't need any other sort of resuscitation not that baby the self-dependent courageous perfectly competent and winning little rascal resuscitated itself instantly too and positively and apparently without the least effort in the world 
moreover and with remarkable directness it demanded what it wanted and got it and having been nourished to its satisfaction from young master bartender's silver-mounted bottle which john fairmeadow then secretly slipped into his pocket and having yawned in a fashion so tremendous that mrs bartender herself could never hope to equal that infinite expression of boredom and having smiled and having wriggled and having giggled and cooed and attempted actually attempted to get its great toe in its mouth without extraneous assistance of any sort whatsoever even without the slightest suggestion that such a thing would be an amazingly engaging trick in a baby of its age and degree it burst into a gurgle of glee so wondrously genuine and infectious that poor bored mrs bartender herself was quite unable to resist it and promptly and publicly and finally committed herself to the assertion that the baby was a dear wherever it came from john fairmeadow snatched it from the table and was about to make off with it when mrs bartender interposed my dear mr fairmeadow said she that child will simply catch its death of cold there was something handy however something of silk and fawn skin and with this enveloping the baby john fairmeadow swung in a roar with it to the bar and held it aloft in all that seething wickedness pure symbol of the blessed christmas festival and there was a sensation of course a sensation beginning in vociferous ejaculations but presently failing to a buzz of conjecture there were questions to follow to which john fairmeadow answered that he had found the baby that the baby was nobody's baby that the baby was his baby by right of finders keepers that the baby was everybody's baby and that the baby would presently be somebody's much-loved baby that he'd vouch for the baby now resting content in john fairmeadow's arms was diffidently approached and examined gingerbread jenkins poked a finger at it and said in a voice of the most inimical description get out without disturbing the baby's serene equanimity in the slightest young billy lush charging his soft boyish voice with all the horrifying intent he could muster threatened to catch the baby as though bent upon devouring it on the spot but the baby only chuckled with delight billy the beast incautiously approached a finger near the baby's stout abdomen and the baby with a perfectly fearless glance into the very depths of the beast's frowsy beard clutched the finger and smiled like an angel long butcher long attempted to tweak the baby's nose but the effort was a ridiculous failure practised so clumsily on an object so small and the only effect was to cause the baby to achieve a tremendous wriggle and a loud scream of laughter these experiments were variously repeated but all with the same cherubic result the baby conducted itself with admirable self-possession and courage as though indeed it had been used every hour of its life to the company of riotous lumberjacks in town the inevitable happened of course billy the beast whose pocket was smoking with his wages proposed the baby's health and there was an uproarious rush for the bar just a minute boys john fairmeadow drawled it was an awkward moment but the jacks were by this time used to being bidden by this man who was a man and the rush was forthwith halted just a minute boys john fairmeadow repeated for your minister the baby was then held aloft in john fairmeadow's big 
kind, sensitive hands, and from this safe perch softly smiled upon the crowd of flushed and bearded faces all round about. "'Boys,' John Fairmeadow drawled significantly, "'this is the only sort of church we have in these woods.' There was a laughing stir and shuffling, but presently a tolerant silence fell, in obedience to the custom John Fairmeadow had established, and caps came off, and pipes were smothered. "'A little away from the bar, please,' the big preacher suggested. Pale Peter nodded to Charlie the Infidel, and the clink of glasses ceased, and the bottles were left in peace and the hands of the bartender rested. "'Now, boys,' said John Fairmeadow, letting the foundling fall softly into his arms, "'I'm not going to preach to you to-night, though God knows you need it. I'm just going to pray for the baby. "'Dear father of us all willful children of the veil,' he began at once, lifting a placid, believing face above the smiling child in his arms. We ask thy guardianship of this child. In us is no perfect counsel for him, nor any help whatsoever that he may surely apprehend. In thine acceptable wisdom thou settest thy little ones in a world where presently only thou canst teach them. Teach thou then this little one. Thou alone knowest the right path for a little boy's inquiring feet lead then this little boy thou alone art saving helper to an adventuring lad help then this lad thou alone art all perceiving and persuasive alone art truth-teller to a bewildered youth and good example in his wondering sight be then good example and teller of truth to this youth thou alone art in the fashioning ways of thine own world a maker of men make then of this little child a man we ask no easy path for him no unmanly way no indulgent tempering of the winds we pray for no riches for no great deeds of his doing for no ease at all nor any satisfaction we ask of thee in his behalf good manhood lead him where true men must go lead him where they learn the all of life lead him where they level down and build again lead him where in righteous strength his hands may lift the fallen lead him where in anger he may strike lead him where his tears may fall lead him where his heart may find a pure desire O Almighty God, lover of children, father of us all alike, make of this child, in the measure of his service and in the stature of his soul, a man. Amen. Amen, indeed. End of chapter 3 The Making of a Man Chapter 4 of Christmas Eve at Swamp's End by Norman Duncan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Christmas Eve at Swamp's End. As for poor little Patty Batch, all this while she sat alone, a doleful heart in the shack at the edge of the big black woods, quite unaware of the momentous advent of a Christmas baby at Swamp's End. The Christmas wind was still high, still shaking the cabin, still rattling the door, still howling like a wild beast in the night, still roaring in the red stove, and snow was falling again, a dry dust of snow which veiled the wondering stars. It was no longer a jolly, rollicking Christmas wind. The gale now, it seemed, was become inimical to the lonely child, wild, vaunting, merciless, terrible with cold. Patty Batch, disconsolate, 
sighed more often than a tender heart could bear to sanction in a child and found swift visions in the glowing coals though no enlivening tableau but dear brave and human little one she presently ejaculated shoot it anyhow and began at once to cheer up and she was comfortably toasting her shins in a placid delusion of stormy mile-wide privacy her mother's old-fashioned long black skirt drawn up from her dainty toes of which of course the eminent john fairmeadow was never permitted to be aware when all at once and clamouring above the old wind's howling there was a tremendous knocking at the door a knocking so loud and commanding and prolonged that patty batch jumped like a fawn in alarm and stood for a moment with palpitating heart and a mighty inclination to fly to the bedroom and lock herself in presently however she mustered courage to call come in in a sufficient tone whereupon the door was immediately flung wide and big john fairmeadow with a wild dusty blast of the gale strode in with a gigantic basket and slammed the door behind him leaving the shivering tenacious shadow which had secretly followed from swamp's end to keep cold vigil outside hello there patty batch john fairmeadow roared merry christmas patty batch stared hello i say john fairmeadow cried again merry christmas ye rascal patty batch gulping her delight and quite incapable of uttering a word because of it flew to the kitchen instead of to the bedroom and returned with a broom with which while the shadow peeked in at the window she brushed and scraped and slapped john fairmeadow so vigorously that john fairmeadow scampered into a corner and stood at bay look out there polly pry he shouted in a rage don't you dare look in my basket patty batch had been doing nothing of the sort don't you so much as squint at my basket john fairmeadow growled patty batch instantly did of course and with her eyes wide and sparkling too it was really something more than a squint keep your eyes off that basket miss pry john fairmeadow commanded again huh he complained emerging from his refuge and throwing his mackinaw and cap on the floor anybody'd think there was something in that basket for you there if patty batch gasped in ecstasy is john fairmeadow scornfully mocked huh patty batch caught john fairmeadow by the two lapels of his coat and she stood on tiptoe and she wouldn't let john fairmeadow turn his head away as if john fairmeadow cared to evade those round glowing eyes and she looked into his gray eyes with a bewitching conglomeration of hope amusement curiosity and adoring childish affection there ith too she chuckled her lisp getting the better of her yeth there ith i know you mr fairmeadow john fairmeadow ridiculously failed to smother a chuckle in a growl doth it bite patty batch inquired maliciously feigning a terrific fright nonsense john fairmeadow declared it hasn't a tooth in its head he added with one eye closed and palms uplifted but uh, aha just you wait and see well patty batch drawled i suppose it's a turkey it certainly thumpin to eat she declared good enough to eat i bet you john fairmeadow agreed with the air of having concealed in that veritable big basket the sweetest morsel in all the world if it a chicken nonsense said john fairmeadow it's far more delicious than chicken hi there paul pry he roared and just in time keep your hands off is it anything for the house no indeed the house is for it patty batch scowled in perplexity 
the back yard too john fairmeadow added and don't you forget that this whole place and all the world belongs to just what's in that basket i'm sure poor patty batch mused scratching her curls in bewilderment i can't guess what it could be both were now staring at the basket and at that very moment the blanket covering stirred it's a dog patty batch exclaimed dog the outraged john fairmeadow roared nothing of the sort no ma'am patty batch clasped her hands it is too she cried i thought move it is not it's a kitten then it is not a kitten thereupon while the shadow by whom john fairmeadow had been dogged that night now peered with acute attention through a break in the frost on the window-pane thereupon without any warning save a second slight movement of the blanket a sound and not by any means a growl the thing was certainly not a dog a sound proceeded from the depths of the basket patty batch jumped away well well cried john fairmeadow what's the row row indeed patty batch was gone white and she swayed a little and shivered too and clenched her little hands to restrain her amazing hope oh she moaned at last far short of breath enough tell me quick if it if it uh ah uh, john fairmeadow threw back the blanket in a most dramatic fashion and there wrapped in the neglected fawn-skin cloak all dimpled and smiling lay the baby by george screamed patty batch it ith a baby your baby john fairmeadow whispered god's christmas gift to you patty batch adorable young mother reverently approached and bending with parted lips eyes shining and hands laid upon her trembling heart for the first time gazed content upon the little face she lifted then and with what awe and tenderness the tiny mortal from the warm basket and pressed it with knowing arms against her warmer softer young breast my baby she crooned her lips close to its ear my little baby my own little baby end of chapter four christmas eve at swamp's end end of the book christmas eve at swamp's end by norman duncan